You're watching Deal Flow, the show that tracks merger and acquisition activity in Africa and beyond. Here we talk to the deal makers, the target companies and, and the M&A analysts. I'm Erika van der Maarden and thanks for joining us. We start our show off this week with the deals of the week. Anglo-American will sell its 50% stake in Lafarge Tarmac to Lafarge for a minimum consideration of $1.5 billion or 16 billion rand. The global miner will use the proceeds to pay down debt. In return, cement maker Lafarge will sell off Lafarge Tarmac in a bid to get regulatory approval for its merger with Holsim. SAB Miller will dispose of its almost 40% stake in Soho Sun. This will be done through a combination of a private placement to institutional shareholders this month and a repurchase of shares by Soho Sun. Alexander Forbes set the offer price for its planned share listing at up to 8.05 rand a share, valuing the pension manager at as much as $962 million or 10 billion rand. Alexander Forbes, which was taken private by a group of investors including buyout firm Actus in 2007, also said it plans to raise $31 million or 330 million rand in fresh capital when it lists on July 24th. Kenyan diversified financial services company British American plans to buy a 24.75% stake in mortgage provider housing finance held by Equity Bank. Welcome back. We're looking this week at the resource prospects on the African continent. We're asking which commodities are attractive, which regions are viable regions for resources production and exports. Joining me in studio, Surya Hay, she's executive director at the Bravura Group, and Hasneen Varavala, he's head of corporate finance at Barclays Africa. Welcome. Really good to have both of you here in studio. Thank you. Hasneen, so we know for a long time resources has been the core story of the African continent and increasingly we're hearing about the emerging consumer on the African continent driving a different kind of growth and perhaps faster growth, catch-up growth. What are you seeing with our focus this week on resources? How significant is resources production still in the region? Resources will continue to be the largest part of the Afri African economy, at least in the, in the immediate term. We're seeing a lot of things happening in other sectors, consumer financial resources, for financial services. Uh, we are seeing it in uh, infrastructure, etc. But um, resource will, resources will remain the core. And that's both on the metals and mining front, as well as when it comes to oil and gas and energy. Mm. Um, Surya, would you agree? And, and increasingly, one sees the questions being asked, um, is Africa advancing and being able to add value to its resources extraction and production? Oh, absolutely, Erika. What we have seen in the last 10 years is such increased investment into Africa, which then allows for development of infrastructure, etc., which allows resource projects which previously would have been very difficult wow. to be developed to now being able to, to be developed. Yeah. So this is a point now you've both raised the infrastructure. So of course, without the roads, the rail, harbors, ports, etc., it's impossible to get the, these va uh, valuable elements to other regions. So are we seeing infrastructure development moving at, f at a fast enough pace, Surya? Never fast enough from our perspective, uh, but, but still increasing. Remember, these are longer term development mm -hmm. projects. So a 10 year project or a 20 year project can wait for infrastructure to also come as it grows. So I mean, if you look at, at the structuring of various resources extraction projects, do they always go hand in hand with infrastructure projects? So the company doing the extraction, would they be wanting to be responsible for at least managing or project managing the, the infrastructure that's needed? Oh, absolutely. Um, particularly when you look at metals and mining projects, uh, you must realize that um, it's, only very, it's only a small part of the problems are below the ground that is related to the geology and things like that. The big issues are the evacuation, infrastructure, the over-the-ground issues which have to be dealt with. That's where the, uh, a large amount of the, effort, um, uh, of the effort and the challenges really are in uh, developing these projects in Africa. So I would imagine then that that's one key element in the decision making of an investor, whether it's an institutional or some, some other a DFI investor, say, in resources. So, so what does mean if you had to set up a framework, what is that decision making framework of an investor? Presumably sort of their own expertise pl plays some initial role, but it's also the demand and supply factors to weigh up. Oh, of course, yes. And um, when you look at these projects, you must first, the first thing is that from the concept to actual production is several years and in fact, sometimes even decades, right? Because these are very large projects that take a long time to put together. There are a number of issues, financing issues, environmental issues, et cetera. Needless to say, many of these, many of these products are, are cyclical in terms of their demand. So how the project proceeds is also gonna be partly dependent 
on that commodity cycle and that playing out. Then again, you've got to overlay the dynamics of what's happening in the financing world. Uh, what's the level of risk appetite in the world? How financeable are some of these projects? And then, of course, depending on which other companies who are actually driving some of these projects, they are the internal, the internal um, issues which many, very often these companies have got to deal with in prioritizing the various projects that they have in front of them. All right. So the capital allocation decision within Is the corporate. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, Surya, further overlay, and I'm sure there are many more, is the, the particular regional risk or the country risk. So we, we might like gold or copper or whatever, but the countries or the regions where that particular commodity um, is concentrated may not be attractive at that point. Yes, now that is true. So first of all, you choose your commodity, but then in resources you are bound to what is in the ground and which countries they are on the ground at. So from that perspective, we use third party instruments and we look at you know, which countries have a political risk profile that is acceptable, an operational risk profile. Um, you look at things like terrorism, unfortunately, for example, in some countries in East Africa today. And from that perspective, you choose the project with the highest geological promise in the lowest country risk. Right. So I know you yourselves are looking, you're busy setting up a fund um, to do resources investing in Africa. So if I were to ask you just on the commodity side, you know, what does your selection framework look like at this stage? From a commodity perspective, we like copper, we like gold, we like the bulk, so iron ore and manganese, but on infrastructure, thermal coal on infrastructure and the nickel sulphides. Nickel sulphides are a very rare thing today. So just to clarify for me, if you say on infrastructure, so in other words, assuming that there's infrastructure to support it. There the needs to be an acceptable infrastructure solution. It, I think the big countries and the Chinese, or the big uh, companies and the Chinese, can invest for 10 and 20 year frameworks. Our framework as Bravura is a seven to eight year framework. Mm -hmm. So you need to see what the acceptable infrastructure solution will be. Hasneen, I'd like to ask you a similar question then and, and, and to, your, to you. What, what are the most attractive commodities at this stage? You spoke about these long leads and lags in decision making. So within that 10 year period, of course, the commodity cycle could change. Absolutely. Um, no different from the uh, many of the um, uh, uh, commodities that Suraya has already, has already referred to. Um, aside from that, uh, you know, coking coal, uh, there continues to be a demand for certain varieties of coking coal, particularly in, the, in uh, China and in India. So that will always remain an, an interesting, interesting story. Uh, energy security is a big issue across Asia. So um, oil and gas projects, um, many of them are very long term, but again, uh, that's, um, that's, an area of, uh, that's an area of focus. Um, and then, um, you know, Africa also is blessed with um, some of the rare earths and uh, projects which involve the rare earths and uh, the specific applications in electronics and things uh, are also quite interesting. Just to, to stoke some controversy, Siri, I know I've had a conversation with you where you say you, you're not interested in rare earths at this point. Why is that? No, it's not that we are not interested, but rare earths often come as byproducts of mines when you mine other commodities. Right. So we do not search for rare earths as a primary product. We may inherit them with other right. project, projects. And then by region, Hasneen, um, which are the most attractive, or by contrast in a negative sense, which regions in Africa would you avoid, even though the commodity they might have a lot of, it's very attractive? No, I, I wouldn't rule out any particular region, but the considerations as Raya mentioned are exactly the right ones. You have to see the um, infrastructure, uh, the government's willingness to participate in that infrastructure. You have to look at the, at the political environment. The other thing is this, that um, for many of these large infrastructure projects, things that help a lot are um, how bankable is that particular country? Now, one of the things that we've seen increasingly in Africa across the last um, decade or so is more and more countries actually going out and getting sovereign ratings, uh, raising sovereign bonds, increasing their own profile with uh, international investors. That is something which is definitely helpful mm -hmm. and, uh, and assists in the ability to get a project done. All right. Surya, what developments are you seeing? Um, as Nina earlier referred to some of the options with the funding options. So, but what structures are you seeing in terms of who's investing, who the, the competitors are in this space, and the kind of models they're putting together? Okay, from a competitor perspective, of course, you get your private equity and then your mezzanine debt, your senior debt are provided. We play as Bravura on the private equity side, so we develop earlier. 
when other people who are prepared to, to lend are not necessarily yet comfortable to lend, so it's not a bankable project yet. Uh, in the private equity space, there's some resource funds. Interestingly enough, only a handful only focus on sub-Saharan Africa. There are huge resource funds who focus globally, but few of them actually invest directly into sub-Saharan Africa, although they are allowed to, but that's not their focus. From a mezzanine and senior debt perspective, if a project has got to a stage where they call it a pre-feasibility or bankable feasibility, then the banks and the MES debt funders are prepared to start to lend. Somewhere in the middle you get these convertible instruments. Uh, as an equity player, I always think they are highly risky for the equity players because in the end you give up such a lot of the project on the basis, you know, if the timing takes longer, yes. etc. Hasneen, I'd like to finish off just briefly, just your, if you're looking 10, 15 years ahead in the commodity space in the African region, what do you see? 10, 15 years ahead, I see a, a number of projects which are, um, uh, you know, flagship projects under development, you know, today. Some of them will come to come to fruition. When some of those come to fruition, they will be actual game changers for some of the countries in which they are. Um, West African I know, for example, if some of these projects come to uh, come to completion, they will fundamentally change the economies um, uh, where they're present. I think you will also see a huge big development taking place in Southern Africa around Mozambique. Uh, where you've got um, oil and gas and the oil and gas developments taking place there, uh, I think that could be quite transformational for the for the whole region. Right. So also in East Africa, I think many of these uh, very large projects will uh, you know will come together, and uh, it'll also be interesting to see the ownership pattern of some of these uh, of some of these assets. Um, while of course you will have the traditional majors being significant uh, owners of of these assets, you're also going to start seeing. Uh, investors from Asia, sovereign funds, uh, state-owned um, mm -hmm. companies from Asia being active owners and managers mm -hmm. of some of these very large projects. Hasneen and Surya, great talking to you, hearing your insights. Uh, my thanks to Hasneen Varavala, he's Head of Corporate Finance at Barclays Africa, as well as Surya Hay, she's Executive Director at the Bravira Group. That's it from us for this week. We'll see you again same time next week.